Hello and welcome to LedgerCast. My name is Brian Krogsgaard. I'm here with Josh Olsewich. Hey, Josh. Hey, Mr. Brian. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing swell. I mean, how could we not be doing swell? Well, swell was the name of that Ripple conference back in the day. <laughs> it just came wow. to my mind. <laughs> uh, but forget Ripple, even though it somehow is above 50 cents again. Uh, security be damned. Um, Bitcoin is above fifty five thousand dollars, Joshua. The about thing about that. Ripple though, the thing about Ripple real quick, not that I want to talk about Ripple ever, but um, it's easier to pump when it's not listed anywhere. The BS yes. the B C H and B S V people understood that very well. But who will they dump on is the thing. Like I mean they're gonna dump on retail, but retail's gonna try to FOMO into stuff that's below a dollar, which is why, you know, it's just the most basic human lizard brain stuff that's going on right now. If you're not an institution or a pension or a corporation, if you're not Michael Saylor buying a billion dollars hand over fist, you are a retail investor who doesn't know anything, no offense, and you are buying anything that's below a dollar and hoping to 10 exit. I mean, that's the Dogecoin mentality. It's the penny stock mentality, right? Yeah. It's the, uh, it's the uh, integer bias. You know, it's, it's all the same stuff everybody's always said. But to see it like play out for real is interesting. Not that I'm like, like a maximalist on BTC and I want everybody to buy BTC and everything's a scam. No, 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 no. This is just reality, right? This is just what people do, you know? I feel like it's one of those things though where people don't make that decision until they actually like create an account somewhere and realize there's more than Bitcoin. Because when I talk to friends, like I was talking to some friends on Thursday and they were like, man, Bitcoin, I can't believe it's over $50,000. How much longer could this go? Isn't this another bubble? And, you know, when you talk to them and it's like their origination of crypto, they know about Bitcoin, they hear about Bitcoin. Like you don't hear people talking as much about altcoins in real life. But I think when they go to like actually FOMO and then they're like, there's this experience of what coins you see as you hop onto the Coinbase app or Robin Hood and you're like, whoa, what are these other coins? This one's only 75 cents. Could it be the next Bitcoin? Could it go to 20,000? And like the altcoiner-ness comes in with the actual onboarding experience more than anything, don't you think? Yeah, I'd agree with that too. I think um, that's kind of what makes it, I like the nobility of the way uh cash app does their onboarding not a sponsor but like it's just bitcoin you know like you just buy sats right i think that's pretty cool the way they do that because i the interface you get you go on coinbase do you remember that thread i did it was like the first thing you see is ave because it's alphabetical order you know it's like switch to something or buy something and you see ave because it starts with aa but anyway yeah 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 um it's the shitcoin cafe, the shitcoin buffet, right? Like, yeah. It's the VCs paying off Coinbase through whatever, lobbying, you know, um, friends, friends of friends, getting their stuff listed. There's a reason that some of this stuff is listed on Coinbase. I hope people realize this at this point, people who are educated like people in this podcast. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? I think the better way to gain exposure to altcoins is doing so in an educated way and perhaps in a simplified way of asset management like you can do on token sets because we're brought to you by token sets and you can just go to ledgerstatus.com slash sets because that's exactly what they offer. You can follow strategies by people so that you're not just FOMOing into something without knowing what it is. They have the DeFi Pulse and other uh, sets and indexes that people put together and they... Uh, have a variety of strategies, you know, discretionary asset management, like I offer with Tulip, uh, or you can learn about that is at ledgerstats.com slash Tulip, or there's automated strategies on there that you can follow or rebalancing strategy strategies, which is how the DeFi uh, pulse index works, which is a, a really cool one. Um, yeah, so there's better ways to go about it than just FOMOing something under a dollar. If you're looking to increase your Bitcoin via trading altcoins, which is our flavor of alt trading around here. You can do that at ledgerstatus.com slash sets. Thanks to Token Sets for being a partner. It's a great or product. You can, or you could just, you know, lump some like everybody else in, under the sun, right? Like all these people want these advanced strategies for doing all this stuff. Uh, not that I'm like well, I think saying, that's what, saying makes... what you do is bad. I'm just saying that 
if if you really want to buy crypto, just buy BTC and hold it. Okay, that's all people have to do. Here's here's my so I told my brother in 20, 2018, right? He buys in at sixteen k, he sells at like nineteen a few weeks ago, and uh, only because he remembered his password on his Coinbase account. Had he just bought and hold and forgot about it, he'd be up three x from where he sold. You know, so it's just like just buy and sell or just buy hold at any level it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. Just look at the chart. Just buy. Okay. <laughs> like, not investment advice. If you want to get in, just don't worry about it. Anyway, that's that's me being triggered. Not by you, but just by people in general. Yeah. Well, I think if you're going to do it, though, something that's more of a uh, maybe an index-based strategy, like what DPI has, is a pretty good way for like a, a regular Joe to go about it, you know? Oh, for sure. Like, st- uh, yeah. Like, for even for me, who you know, does this stuff every day. I don't know enough about DeFi to like follow everything all the time. Um, so yes, I, I love an in, I love the index idea. I love the idea of a Bitwise 10, for example. I love the idea of um, stuff that we're doing on Brave New Coin for, for indices, stuff that I can't talk about that's coming out. Um, there's also something at Enzyme that I'm doing, which is a copy trading type platform similar to um, token sets, but yeah. Yeah, I love I love all of it. It's just that people, I think people get paralyzed when they see the price and don't know what to do. And they just need to buy, you know? Like we talked about <laughs> you this. You just gotta pull the trigger. We talked about this uh, a good bit in 2017 because it was like, I don't know where to buy on this parabolic move up. And you had done some studies on it that was like, Basically, in a bull market, trying to buy the dip, you're probably, or even DCA, you're probably going to end up with a higher average price versus if you just bought at any given time, even if it was a local top. Um, so that's yeah. kind of where you're coming from with this concept, right? Right. So I haven't, I haven't looked at it again, but uh, when I looked at it a few years ago, lump sum buying was better than dollar cost averaging by a wide margin. Um, only because the chart has an insane bullish bias over time. Yeah. Like I was, I run into it too. When I have friends tell me, Hey, I want to get in. I'm like, okay, just wait till the next 20% or more dip. Um, it's hard to tell someone, Hey, buy at 30, 38 K here, you know, like after a run up from 10. Um, but after it dipped to 30, I at least felt a little better telling them like, hey, this is a better time to buy because it's had this dip. What's interesting is psychologically, they don't really like doing that very much. Um, yeah, here's that DCA analysis you have. What's that website? DCA, oh, this isn't, BTC? it's not mine, but the site is dcabtc.com. Yeah. And it and you, and you can, you know, it'll compare it to, at least it used to compare it to gold. And uh, why isn't that on here anymore? And it's just probably so much stronger than gold. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you, used to, you used to be able to compare it to gold in the S&P. Interesting. Yeah, so you can calculate, you know, what is historic DCA, what is uh, lump sum isn't on here even. But um, anyway, this is a website you can use to like just see what is. How does it compare? Or how what, does it compare? It if you DCA it over time. Right. I think in a bear market, like when you know it's a bear market, DCA is fantastic because it's hard to predict yes. when is the bottom going to be. Yes. Um, once, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> once there's a clear bull market reversal, say for instance, clearing the 20 week, go, you know, crossing the 200 day moving average, stuff like that, then probably just buying and trying to buy earlier in that cycle is going to be better. The thing is, people are very timid when it's a, um, you know, it's not the popular thing to do, right? Like, what is that called? A, 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 a starts with a C. Um, like a contra investor, you know, like the, they don't like, they don't like doing that. Um, like the, against the counter narrative type of trader. Um, I think there's that. And most people are, uh, extremely contrarian. risk. Thank you, Zeno. It's contrarian and my brain is broken. It's Friday. So thank you. People I think are- most people are risk averse in general. I don't think, but they're not because then they're FOMOing 50 K after it was 10 K a few months ago. They're risk averse, so they don't get in. They see price going up and up and up. They um, 
are just confused, you know, if you, if you don't know, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying like, this is how it is. Like this, I was there in 2013, you know, I know how it, how it goes. Um, so unless you understand this stuff, unless you sort of buy into some of the narratives, you don't have to be like a doomer libertarian to like see that. But um, yeah, I mean, that's just how it is. People are, most people are risk averse. Just, that's just how it is. Yeah. Well, why don't we dig into the actual market? Because, you know, what people want to know is how long does this leg have, right? Like we got the, we were a little slow off the Tesla breakout, but we finally did get some continuation off of that. Um, well, the of, tes Tesla breakout, I'll bring up the chart, essentially absorbed all of the uh, minor outflows from, uh, I forget his name, but he's he basically said he, he had enough BTC to sell for the next 50 years and couldn't sell, <laughs> couldn't sell all the VTC he has within his lifetime. Some, a miner actually said that? Yeah, it's, it's some like Chinese miner who's like a bajillionaire and yeah. I didn't see that news. Uh, so he just said, I'm gonna start putting it on the offer. Um, let people so come this, and get it. Yeah, so this was probably him. Um, January 17, January 29, when the miner outflows hit record levels, um, that was most likely him. Interesting. I didn't realize oh, yeah. that even occurred. That's so why Tesla, I have you. Tesla absorbed some of that. Um, all the other corporations absorbed some of that. GBTC absorbed some of that. Um, that's why it's hard. It's hard to be bearish when you see outflows. People are selling more than they've ever sold, and price won't go down. You know. Well, mining is more profitable than it's ever been as well, right? Yeah, I mean the break even for mining is at like 10k. Yeah, which is historically. Uh, kind of scary because in bear markets we treat that as what's our cost basis what's our floor um and in bull markets it's kind of terrifying because you're so far off that floor it just means everybody's in massive profit same thing with ethereum and gpu mining but with bitcoin mining and asics like their costs are much higher uh so when their cost basis is like 25 percent of the price that's it freaks me out a little bit um, because it gives so much wiggle room for drawdown if the largest holders decide they want to sell in mass. If suddenly people aren't there to absorb it, it makes me nervous. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a basic supply demand thing. If, if, if buyers are there to absorb the selling, like Link, Link is making 137 million plus USD yeah, a loves, month. They love to sell. Then price will remain flat or go up, right? Like that's just, so yeah, it's a concern if um, it costs whatever millions to keep BTC up per day. But right now that buying is there to absorb it, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, and what we're doing so far is just running the fibs and like Tesla ran right to the 1.618 and it was just bullish reaccumulation at the 1.618 until breaking above it, a little more accumulation. And then we hit the measured move. So the measured move, this is more of a technical show than some of our streams, Measured move is when you take the uh, top of a consolidation to the bottom of a consolidation. The height of that as an extension is going to be your measured move. So when I run a FIB extension, it's the two. It's not a real FIB. It's just the two. So we hit the measured move on BTC. Now it's a matter of are we going to run the rest of the FIBs? I love this run the FIBs concept in bull markets. Only in crypto are you looking at 2.618, 3.618, 4.618. Uh, but that gets us to 60k if we take the if we start running the fibs now after the measured move. I do think we can consolidate here for a bit, maybe do some catch up on uh, Ethereum relative pairs, something like that. Uh, but it looks like we're gonna we're on a crash collision course for 60k plus, don't you think, Josh? Yeah, for sure, no doubt. Um, I just pulled up the mining profitability. I'll we'll get back to the targets in a second. Yeah, that's fine. So if we zoom way out, mining profitability, I mean, a lot of this is based on inflation or disinflation over time, but if you zoom way out, you know, mining profitability is a, a rounding error based on where it was historically. Um, if we zoom in the past three years, it's definitely nearing 2019 levels, but it's still like, it's not as rosy as, as you know, as you might think it would be based on price. There's still a massive profit to be had based on their their basis or their uh cost to mine um but profitability overall isn't actually as insane as you think it would be um uh, mostly because of difficulty rising um 
then difficulty rising comes from more mining capacity coming online. Right. So it's just, it's a zero sum game. So if difficulty is going to all time highs, which is, you know, it's just, it's nonstop all time highs. Right. So it's harder for any individual miner to accumulate. Somebody was asking this to us to talk about on, on the stream recently on Twitter. And it was, the question was about, is there even new mining hardware out there or is the mining hardware that's a couple years old still like perfectly decent? right now because it used to be this constant battle right like new chips and new hardware coming out that six months later your profitability was so down because the capacity of the new miner was so good this cycle i haven't really heard near as much of that so is is it is is there great brand new hardware or are people still using older stuff i've heard about these s19s a bit those are the newest ones right yeah, so I mean, you can, there's this great site, ASIC Miner Value. Uh, I don't know who runs this, but thank you so much because it's really helped me understand the ASIC situation. Um, there are definitely new ASICs in the pipeline continuously for, for SHA-256 specifically. So yeah, they'll, there's, we're never going to run out of ASICs for BTC. SHA-256 is the Bitcoin mining algorithm. Right, so uh, SHA-256 is what's used uh, on the BTC network. So these ASICs are specific to the algorithm for the most part. Some of them can mine multiple algorithms. Um, if you're a GPU, a lot of my gamer friends are like, why are the GPUs out of stock everywhere? Well, you can thank ETH for that. But yeah, they mine Ethereum mostly with GPUs. Um, right. Um, so yes, we have tons of ASICs. There are, if you look at the um, So the what's the cost stuff, of a, what's the cost of an Antminer S19? Uh, the cost? Yeah, I'm gonna look it up. I don't. I, I'm not sure. Like, it's gonna take you a second to recoup your ROI. Yeah, because um, at forty dollars a day, that's not a ton. No, but that's at twelve cents per kilowatt hour. If your electricity cost is four cents per kilowatt hour, though, you're. I mean, ETH obviously. Uh, look at that ETH profitability. It's insane. It's yeah. absolutely so insane. So people that have their energy figured out are making a ton. Right. right. People. The, people are using geothermal, or people who are using wind. You know. Uh, those people are paying next to nothing for electricity. Yeah. All right. So an Antminer S19 Pro, I can get for $3,500 just off of some random website, bitminersplus.com. Um, so the payoff period, if you're paying a lot of money for electricity, that 12 cents per kilowatt hour, that's more like what an American, like if I just ran it in my basement, that's kind of the type of price I could expect, right? Right. So... At forty dollars a day, that's an eighty-seven day payoff. Wow, that's not a lot. Yeah, it's a pretty good Wait, deal, did I which do is that? it's a yeah. it's a it's an illusion though because that profitability doesn't last forever, obviously. And yeah, if but profitability if could, is high, then more people are buying miners. That's at twelve cents per kilowatt hour. You're paying it off in three months, even with like regular home energy cost like if you have any good deal for energy cost if you have cheap energy or efficient energy these people could be paying these off in one month at the 300 dollars a day uh profitability so this is massively profitable for miners right now this is i i need to pull on a miner friend to get them to talk about it because that is that's intense man that's kind of scary to me because it your floor is so low like if you dump, if they decide to dump, like they just have so much control, right? Like that you need all the, you need the Teslas <laughs> buying your, buying your bags. If the miners are constantly incentivized to dump. They have control. They are whales, but at the same time, the Guinea coefficient or the like distribution of coin, freshly mined coin is, should be increasing because there are more and more entities getting into mining. Um, it's still mostly Asia, mostly China, blah, blah, blah. But uh, yeah, any any whale, like, you know, nobody's said anything about Mount Gox recently, but that's a massive amount of coin that's going to be unlocked. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, people are going to sell that coin immediately to market. They're just going to do that. What what would you do if you had a windfall that you've been waiting on for eight years at this point? <laughs> when when what, Gox what? went down, what was the price of one Bitcoin? Like... I don't know, a thousand dollars, like nothing. It was nothing. Yeah. So if you get, if you are fortunate enough to get some coins back and you had, let's say you had five Bitcoin 
at a thousand dollars. It wasn't a ton of money. And now you just been sitting here with this force hodl and now you have $250,000. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So any, anytime we're talking about whales, the real concern is what you're exactly what you're saying. The same thing with the, uh, the Bitcoin miner example, any whale who just market dumps, right. It's going to be a concern. Uh, we saw this in 2018 when the Mount Gox custodian, uh, was selling basically near the highs in 2017 and then selling the lows in 2018. You basically sold the lows in 2017 as well. Um, it's always a problem. Like that's never not a problem, which is part of the reason why Elon is talking about the, the whales of Doge to, to sell, you know, why he, why he cares about Doge. Well, I don't know. But. Speaking of Elon, my research assistant, Pat, uh, told me to pull up Elon's profile picture right now on Twitter. He did the laser eyes with, I don't know, Bitcoin anime girl uh, as his profile picture now. So, I mean, when this is your ambassador and it's the richest man in the world, and <laughs> I mean, it's hard It's hard to go wrong. Even when he says, like, Bitcoin is almost as big of a scam as fiat, but not as big, and the, the not as big is a, is a big deal. Uh, like, how can you both FUD and be bullish in the same comment, but he managed to do it? Um, I don't understand the laser eyes thing. Honestly, I find Bitcoin memers less interesting than pretty much all other crypto memers. Can what's the laser eyes thing? Is this a pomp thing? I have no idea. I don't care. I, I just ignore most of that stuff, honestly. Well, you know, what? Elon is having fun getting rich <laughs> and being <laughs> extraordinarily rich. Uh, CZ was on Bloomberg today. Speaking of extraordinarily rich. Oh yeah. And in shilling BSC, this has got to be one of the topics of the show because, um, I mean, the BNB ecosystem is going ham. Ethereum maximalists are furious talking about the lack of decentralization in BSC in which Carpe Noctum just gives evil laugh of, uh, the ir irony of that situation. Um, I mean, nobody cares. People, people, uh, you know, maximal, the problem with maximalism is you think people are on your side and on board with you if they are in your cult for, for a few weeks. The moment something looks better on the other side of the fence, in the case of the ETH fees, which are absolutely insane still, then of course people are going to switch, right? If people are not honest maximalists and aren't like on board and going like to all the ETH developer conferences and stuff, right? Like if you're, if you don't care, you're going to trade whatever. You don't care if it's centralized or decentralized. Um, if you can make money, yeah, that's why most people are chasing, here. They're chasing yield, uh, and you can do it with low fees. And honestly, most people are not idealists. They're profit maximalists, and they just do not care. Um, people are really digging into the Sasano meme. Have you seen this? Um, <laughs> so you can actually... This is one of the uh, Anthony Sassano, nice guy, but he has this like beard and hat identity thing. And he tweeted about being upset. And now um, people are making memes of uh, of his his being upset. Wojak memes. It's pretty good. Um, well, they had years, they being the ETH people, they had years in an onslaught of quote unquote ETH killers who really didn't do anything until a centralized entity stepped up and is a direct competitor in a lot of ways to ETH. Uh, because they they can't scale, fees got out of control. That's just a fact. Uh, they know it's the fact because they're switching to proof of stake. Like they're they're working on it, but it's just too slow, right? And if it's Darwinian and somebody steps up to the plate and is like, okay, let's let's make a competitor and see how it goes. Yeah, I even mean, though even though the pancake swap volume is questionable, because honestly, anything CZ has ever done is questionable. Let's be real here. I will say I do like the pancake swap people a lot. They're really nice. Uh, I've been getting a ton of activity on a YouTube video I did about pancake swap four months ago, uh, which should have been a sign for me to long the crap out of cake and BNB, &B, but I didn't think about it when I started getting a lot more notifications from that video. Um, a ton of money's flowing there. I do think, you know, CZ has the ability to push a lot of that himself with some of the momentum. But I mean, I also know a lot of friends um, who are doing the same. And, you know, it's not just CZ. He can kickstart something, but he's not going to be all of it. Uh, everybody that I know that's into yield farming or, you know, like the speculative DeFi stuff, they're all 
they've all been dancing on, on BSC. I haven't even had time to pay attention to it. So I've, I've missed out on it. I'm having fun staying poor in that regard. Um, but there is real money in there. That's not, not CZs because people chase the profit. They chase the yield no matter where it is. They're always going to do that before, uh, following their ideals. We've seen that forever and always in crypto and in life. It is the natural flow for incentives for everyone. Yeah, it's not like it's not some shocking surprise. So, the, you know, the ETH people needed to realize the honeymoon isn't going to last forever when fees are pricing people out of the market, quite literally. Um, well, and this is ETH's doing fine. It's at almost two thousand dollars per. But a lot, you know, uh, Pancake at least technically had more volume than Uniswap on a twenty-four hour basis, and uh, friggin' BNB is at three hundred and twenty-four dollars right now which is, I mean, legitimately insane. Like, What is it at? Did you say 324? I said 324. I Since when? Today? <laughs> I haven't looked at it today. Yes. So. Well, today it started at uh, 193. So on one daily candle, 193 to 324. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm speechless. Yeah. I sold at 130, which looks high, and then it went twice that. Well, no, three times that almost. Um, so once it broke its all-time high, you know, they say if you just trade the chart, chart, trading is pretty easy. But the question is, where do you sell, right? Like it breaks its USD all-time high, buy all-time highs. This is what everyone in Ethereum wanted to see in Ethereum. <laughs> you break the all-time high and then you like 8x out of that. Well, BNB is the one that did it and they did it in three weeks. Um, I mean, it's pretty centralized coin, what a yada yada, who cares? Profit is profit. People are going to chase that, no doubt about it. And I am sad that I didn't participate in that more because not only has this broken its all-time high at 47 and then 9x or whatever that is, it's extraordinarily liquid. Like you're getting a 9x on something that you can dump millions of dollars if you have it to back on the market. It's not like getting a 10x in something where you're going to, push the price down like 25% if you try to sell. Um, so I'm happy for anyone that took part in that and, and did well with it. And it clearly, clearly has taken some of the air out of the, the ETH DeFi balloon uh, as money chases it. That's just, that's just what happens. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, you're pricing people out of the market. I mean, yeah. it's just, now, that's a fact. Now, would we buy BNB here? Absolutely not. I would be profit taking here. I'd profit, I did so 50% ago. Um, and what I had was purely for, because I was trading on Binance US and using it for fees and just bought some amount that was more than I would need for the fees. I dumped that. Like I didn't even enter it as a trade. So I'm an idiot. Uh, I, I did not see this coming despite all the warning signs being there. Um, yeah. Wow. Feels, ba feels bad, man. You know, nobody, nobody is happier than the BNB employees and CZ. Who, yeah, because uh, they are, they are definitely. You know who's dumping right now? Binance employees. <laughs> That's well, they, they get paid. Uh, some of them take their sal full salary. Some of them take bonuses in uh, uh, BNB, or they all take bonuses in BNB. But yeah, um, wow. I'm the the quarterly uh, burn is going to be absolutely insane for BNB this this quarter because the profit has to be gross. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, I wonder was this the was today he was on Bloomberg earlier today, right? Um, I wonder if I wonder if that helped us. Yeah, the Bloomberg like, the Bloomberg thing sparked the put the big push from the hundreds to the three hundreds yesterday. Uh, so David, aka Trustless State from Bankless, said that Nick Carter had written a blog post about the negative feedback loops with the fees and how when the fees increase that it's gonna uh, essentially put the brakes on the the pumps. And so he wrote this good article that talks about those negative feedback loops. And um, that's a good read that we'll put in the in the links. And I totally agree. It killed DeFi summer entirely. Like, I don't think that's happening now. Like, I don't think Ethereum and DeFi is just going to poop out because fees are high. Uh, but it does put, put the brakes on the rapid speculation, you know, like making 10 trades a day and all that kind of stuff. Because if you're spending... 10 trades a day, if you're spending $1,000, you know, on round trip trades, chasing a pump, you have to make a lot of money to justify that type of fee. Um, 
you have Mark Cuban, who is a billionaire, complaining about ETH fees, okay? Yeah. That's when you know the fees are probably too high and things are, are not scaling correctly, right? Nobody, nobody loves crapping on Ethereum more than me, uh, but th that's just the fact of it of the, of the matter, right? Like we both experienced this personally, so <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, that's enough about ETH fees, but um, can we just talk about BTC targets real quick? Yeah. So I like I like the MA multiplier the, a lot. Um, historically, it's been really good at predicting um, sort of near near the top or where the top is going to be. And right now, the top of the 5x two-year multiplier is around 57, 58K. And if we look at the historical uh, data, just what we have, an N of two, it's basically spent a month and a half above the 5x multiplier when it breaks it. Um, and then then that's the top. So as crazy as, as we are now, right? Like this can get crazier for the next month and a half. So basically um, saying we are hot, but we're not uh, in the red of the overheating range. Right. So this is this is where I'd be I'd be concerned. And we can look at um, I'll pull up MVRV as well. And the Puel multiple, which is basically how much USD is needed to keep up price. Um, Looking to Bitcoin.com, not a sponsor. I just feel like this website's free. Go check it out. Um, Puel multiple daily coin issuance in USD divided by the 365 MA of daily coin issuance. Um, actually, this looks okay. Uh, historically, if this gets above a certain range, those are the tops. This looks fine. Um, Pi cycle top, which has predicted the top to three days every single time. So it's it's the 350 MA times two with a 111 MA crossover, just some random stuff, right? But it's worked for whatever reason. I don't know who discovered this, does he even say? Uh, Philip Swift might say down here, but anyway, um, we are getting closer, but we're not there yet. So yeah. just, just check out this website. You know, if you're not, if you're like paralyzed as far as what to do, here's MVRV, which is another one of these on-chain metrics. It's approaching, um, the highs uh we're definitely at and a this is for high. this is for cyclical top type stuff typically not like, right what this, this isn't tends day to trading tell, stuff this is yeah like i i'm kind of in the boat of like we could be due for the seventh inning stretch you know like calm down for a minute especially i love that 60k type of round round number you know like the fomo over 50 and you know go straight to 60 and then cool down um so I'm kind of on the team that I think we're due for a 20, 25% drawdown, maybe not immediately, but within the next couple of weeks. And then we kind of uh, refuel and, and rest up for the big push, uh, which is to my mind, six figure Bitcoin. Um, I that, mean, would be a, that would be ideal. I mean, I say it all the time, the slower this goes, the better, the more random sell-offs we have, the better that just, it fuels the, the cycle. Yeah. Senator Cynthia Loomis is in on Laser Eyes too. The Twitter account that tracks congressional changes to Twitter profiles. Uh, she went from little Laser Eyes to big Laser Eyes on her profile picture. This is a United States senator. It's just there's so much attention on crypto, and I just highlight that one plus Elon Musk, which everybody knows. It's like you got senators and and celebrities. Everybody's talking crypto. It feels topish, but it. I think what the trap is going to be is we have the drawdown and people are like, there you go, game over. That was it. Look at all these obvious top things. I still believe, and you know, Kobe has talked about this on the other stream a few times, where it's like the top things of the previous cycle are never the top things of the next cycle, right? You tend to normalize the things from one cycle to the next. So the Katy Perry fingernails that were top things and the NFL players talking about Bitcoin in locker room, we're normalizing those things this time, but they can help assists like a local top like and uh but it's not going to be what marks like the cycle top in my mind yeah i agree um that's why i like the technicals you know just pay attention to technicals and on-chain stuff if active addresses are going up you know i'm not worried about anything that just represents new people getting in yeah there are a lot of new people getting in um hey, there's another bitcoin related thing that i wanted to talk about um 
You know, have you played with Jack Mahler's uh, Strike app at all? I have not. It's pretty cool. Like, it's, uh, I think it's quite good. Um, and what's interesting about this is you can actually do uh, deposit, like, straight through a bank transfer or a debit card, uh, like, right away. And then it's a Lightning wallet. Uh, so you can do a request for funds or whatever. And I think they have some help, like, pulling liquidity in. And I think some of those apps are going to be good for helping people, like, onboard more quickly, like, straight to BTC. And it's good for kind of that long-term stuff. And I bet we'll see more news where, you know, Square invests in Strike or, you know, something like that. And we get more, like, of these new people toolings that, help increase the number of active addresses on Bitcoin, increase the number of Lightning wallets. We'll start to see the Lightning network have better adoption. Um, as that comes into fruition, that's when I think you move into the later stages of the bull cycle, right? You really have those avenues for anyone and everybody to onboard. Yeah, I mean, Lightning network can't exist with people knowing about it. It has to exist in the background. It's way too complex to have some random person get involved. That's just the way it is. So until yeah. that's the case, until it's just an afterthought in the background, uh, it's never going to take off. No, that's kind of why I brought up Strike, though, because yeah. when you, when yeah, you yeah, download yeah. it, it's like, you know, just get some from your bank. Now, if you actually have to request funds from somebody, you have to realize, I don't think you're getting regular Bitcoin network Bitcoin. You're getting Lightning. And so the, you have to learn then. But if you're just doing it for a uh, buy and hold some out of your, like, DCA and buy from your bank or whatever, then you really don't know, have to know much about Lightning. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's how it has to be. Again, David's talking about L2s on Ethereum and um, how he think is it, uh, he's not saying this, but, like, essentially Ethereum L2s will outpace uh, Lightning Network. They're already doing so. And my one of my predictions earlier... Uh, a couple months ago, I think, was saying I thought that Ethereum L2s would have 10x the adoption of, of Lightning this year. But my purpose was because it you have to transact on Ethereum. You don't have to transact on Bitcoin, you know. The whole purpose of being on Ethereum is to transact. And if you if the fees are too absurd to transact on Layer 1, the, the, the forced move to Layer 2 will be, like, really, really severe and really, really quick. I feel like as soon as Uniswap or whatever adopts it, everybody's going to move liquidity to, lo to Layer 2 on Ethereum. And I definitely think the push to Layer 2 will be a good cause for like renewed FOMO into DeFi tokens. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, you know? Well, I mean, BTC, BTC that... had scaling and governance crises and came out on top, right? Yeah. After all of a sudden done, there was forks, there was this, there was that, right? Whatever. And I think we'll see that with Ethereum and alternative chains. Is like Ethereum will still be dominant on the compute side of things. You know, um, I don't. Really yeah, that's that's fine. I don't view Ethereum as a store of value. Yeah. I view it as a it is a speculative uh, transact token. Sure, uh, you know that isn't the mo for Ethereum. It never has been. Never will be. I don't care what the ETH people say. Um, that's not the use case for Ethereum. Not yet. It's not, it's not, it's not store yet. value. <laughs> it's, it's not buy and hold. It's not deflationary yet. The Right. Again, the, I'll believe it when I see it, right? Yeah, show me, the, show me the code. Let me see it working. And the monetary case is not hardened the way Bitcoin's is because even when the Ethereum improvement proposal 1559, when it passes, which would burn the baseline gas fees and potentially move it to deflationary, it's elastic, right? It's the balance of what fees get burned versus new issuance and how it all works together. Whereas Bitcoin is not elastic. It is a deterministic formula. We know exactly what the supply will be, exactly how it'll change over time. That's the difference between whether, to what degree are the two a store of value or money? Um, and that'll, that'll be a big difference maker. That said, I still think Ethereum will be dominant. I would use any opportunity in BNB or whatever to cycle profits back to things I trust in more. Yeah, I'm not like saying that's bad for ETH. I'm just saying that that's the state of things right now. You know, like that's where we are. <laughs> so until we're fully functional, proof of stake, layer two, whatever, which may take however amount of time, that's just the state of things, you know? Yeah. So hey, I wanted to bring something else up on ETH BTC. 
Yeah. Uh, it is hitting my weekly levels uh, that I had outlined, and I think it'll – if it fails it, I've got another level below. I'm kind of disappointed in myself because it hit the 200-week moving average as resistance, and I didn't even see it, and I should have known. Um, but that's exactly where the relative pair started failing. Um, and I, I just – the 200-week moving average is my go-to – um, technical indicator across all assets, across all asset classes, across all pairs. Don't care. 200 weeks. Uh, I use it and love it on everything, and I completely missed it as rejection on ETH BTC. I would have saved myself some money if I paid attention to that and saw it. Um, that said, I think that ETH is kind of at a decision area relative to BTC. Um I think you've talked about how untradeable this is uh, in a variety of ways, but I feel like if it's going to bounce, it's going to do it here. Um, and it, it, for me, it's hard to find, like, where is that invalidation? Like, is it below 0.032? Um, is it basically right here? Like, it's, there's all, it, gets a, it gets real fuzzy below. Um, yeah, so this goes to your point that it's difficult to trade, but I'm mad at myself for not catching that resistance at 0.045. Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, I look at it literally every day, and every day I just don't have anything to say about it because it's just so all over the place. Um, if you're looking at the volume profile, which is the volume at a specific price, um, 0319, 0311, whatever that level is, um, is a pretty significant um, volume area. So if it's going to bounce, it's got to do it around 031. It's got to. Otherwise, it's going to be trapped between 031 and 02. Um, but the issue for me with ETH over BTC is until we have corporations, pensions, and endowments getting into ETH, which I don't see happening, I haven't heard about, rather, any time over the past few weeks. Um, I've heard a lot about funds wanting to get into DeFi, but that's not directly ETH. It's like ETH right. throughput. Right. Um, but if we're talking about BTC versus ETH, you know, I don't see it <laughs> uh, as like winning out anytime soon. It had its fun. Fees got insane. And now things are, people are seeking other avenues. Um, eh, that's, I, I'm, I'm so not saying ETH isn't bullish. I just don't see it like flipping BTC in the next six months. That's just, I don't see it. Yeah. I mean, I still think it's got a date with 0.055. Um, that's having, fair. Yeah. Having two that's straight fair. weeks down doesn't make it any easier for me. If ETH got into the, I'm not I'm not very bullish ETH above 0.055. Like it could even go to 0.08, which is kind of a just another technical level that's a reference from 2017, 2018. I have a hard time up there though. Um, yeah, it's a more difficult um, place for me to to like ETH, and I'd probably want to be cycling back uh, at that point. But what that means is because I like 0.055. Even as it's kind of lollygagging around, I'm still bullish on ETHUSD. I still think it's going to get significant price expiration because I want to win my steak dinner from you. Um, <laughs> I am willing to hold it even though it's had some down weeks. And I've had people message me like, hey, I like ETH, but I am uh, I have a little less Bitcoin now. And um, I think your position sizing, if you're going to maintain that exposure, just has to be representative of that, right? Like 100% ETH. And ETH is up less than one percent on a day that BTC is up eight percent is gonna, not going to feel very good, you know. But it doesn't mean you just—it doesn't mean I don't want any ETH exposure at all. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I've 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 held ETH for several months over the past year because you know I don't trade the pair; I just trade the the market. So yeah. I don't know. Uh, let me just talk real quick about the exchange reserves. So BTC exchange reserves continue to dwindle lower and lower. If, if you zoom way out, I think Glassnodes has the data uh, before. I don't know if I can zoom out on this, but anyway, uh, this is bullish, right? Just supply demand stuff, just extremely basic, basic, basic things. If we look at ETH exchange reserves, they're even more dramatic, um, declining. Bitcoins. And to me, this is a bullish but, divergence. But that's because... going, that's exchange reserves because all ETH is just going straight to DeFi, right? It's moving on chain and being put to use in the network, which is super bullish. Uh, sure. 
<laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't disagree. I just think just looking at this for face value, like if it's on a centralized exchange, it's easier to sell. If it's in DeFi, you can also sell it. But um, anyway, exchange reserves for Ether declining. I, I think price would be going up more than it is um, based on that. Uh, GBTC still adding coins continuously. Um, as it goes up, bullish. Uh, ETH continuously adding coins. As it goes up, bullish. Like you can't not be bullish on this stuff if if people are buying in, right? I mean, that's just I keep saying it over and over again. It was just basic, basic stuff. Yeah, uh, I want to touch on something in legacy before we get out of here. Yeah, we talk about it frequently, but we haven't talked about it too much in the past couple of weeks. Um, we both thought that the dollar rally would be relatively muted and it got rejected really before even the 20 week it got to it. Um, and all this looks like is weakness to me. This looks like a bear flag on the, on the Dixie on the weekly. Uh, I continue to be bearish the dollar. I continue to see very little justification for why I should be bullish. It's a crowded trade, but I don't think it matters very much. I feel like there's just too much against it. Um, and I feel like the dollar is going to make new lows. It's going to drop below 90 with a weekly close. And I think when it does, it'll quickly make new lows relative to what it did in 2018. And that's the, that's the big push for, Bit, uh, for Bitcoin. Um, so this is a hard, this is a completely different narrative than like, I think we might have that 20% pullback soon. Um, I don't know what that would look like. Like maybe it, f you know, goes here, goes here, then does this like, uh, because Bitcoin really does play with a pretty direct correlation to the Dixie. So that's why we like to talk about it. Uh, these vertical lines were cyclical shifts in Bitcoin and notice their bottoms and tops in the Dixie. Um, so like we could have a couple weeks down in the dollar that correlates to Bitcoin going to 60, 66, 70. And then maybe then we get our 20% correction, go like confirm the, the breakdown and then make new lows. And there's your six figure Bitcoin move. I will continue watching the dollar. I continue to be extraordinarily bearish the dollar. Uh, and the only fears I have about it are the fact that it's crowded, but sometimes crowded trades win for a really long time. And you've got BTC versus gold pulled up. Yeah, so I keep seeing um, long time metal bugs. I don't know how to group them all together, but um, silver and gold bugs saying they're, they're switching to uh, BTC. They're just trying to be realists and say they think it's eating the market. I saw one yeah. of those today. Yeah, so I've seen I've seen two in the past week. Um, but if you just look at the chart, I mean, what you can't argue, right? Um, you could say like gold is less volatile. It's a well-proven store of value, whatever. I don't know, but uh, BTC and gold are diverging rather dramatically, especially over the past uh, few months since October. It's just, uh, it's kind of night and day and it's, it's the ratio is hitting an all time high. What's interesting to me is not, not, I wasn't looking at gold yet. I can look at it in a second, but independently, I kind of like the silver chart, but yeah. it's pretty yeah. frustrating if you're in this and you've like since last August, like it had a huge push and then it's not done anything since August where the, you know, Bitcoin's done everything since August. So like, that's gotta hurt if you're in that asset. Similarly for uh, gold, it made that all time high August 10th, went to price discovery and then failed the prior all time high. And honestly, it's just closing the week on a horrible, I mean, really bad look. Gold has got to be one of the more difficult assets to trade. And I don't know exactly why. Um, this is painful. This is a monthly chart with seven months, seven months of down after the supposed price exploration, off we go to the, you know, the promised land of gold bugs. And like, you just see Bitcoin go from 10K to 50K while you go down the whole time. Like that's, that's painful. Uh, I don't know what to say. Yeah, on the cloud, it's uh, it's kind of bounce or die situation. If it doesn't bounce at uh, 17.6, it's going to 16 for sure. Do you think some of this is a, uh, it seems like a different correlation than just pure inflation expectations, right? Because in, if you just have inflation expectations or weak dollar, people could look at 
other avenues, right? They can look at equities or they could look at uh, other commodities. They don't have to look at gold. And I think, but it's interesting that gold is like so severely the laggard of the whole bunch. And it's so rationally like one of the first places you feel like you'd want to go, especially as, which we've talked about, the correlation with the VIX, which both Bitcoin and gold have historically performed well as the VIX uh, like tops and then they trend well while the VIX goes lower, right? Yeah, the VIX is still uh, above 20. It broke below last week, but it's back above it. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what to think about legacy other than there's just a new, there's a new thing in town. It's both risk off, risk off. It's disinflationary. The inflation is lower than gold, allegedly. I don't know what the exact gold inflation is, but BTC is less than 1.8%. We have people rotating their metals to gold 2.0. Um, people are exiting the dollar, looking for other safe havens to hold stuff. People are speculating on BTC. We have corporations getting in. I mean, I don't know. The, the we entire... Have, we just have cascading shorts being liquidated right now, too. <laughs> like, while we talk, we're just going straight to 56 uh, 10 minutes after the market closed. So, it's just super bullish. Uh, it's just a continuous onslaught of uh, new people getting in. I mean, this is exactly what you want to see in a bull market, right? Uh, it totally freaks me out when I put it in linear, Josh. I know you're a log maximalist, but in linear, does this not scare you just a little bit? I mean, it's, I don't want to use the word, the words new paradigm, but um, hey, you know, this, what's happening now is what, what Bitcoiners have talked about for the past 10 years as far as what could happen and what they want to happen. So here we are. Like, let's put this on the BLX and then let's just fade it. This is what Kobe has talked about. Like, how do you know when it's the top? And he says, he's like, when when the previous cycle is so flat that it disappears. So like, okay, it's like, okay, well, this was, this was a top and Bitcoin's dead at 1200 in 2013. But then you scoot it over and then all of a sudden that one looks like it didn't even exist because the next bubble is so big. Mm -hmm. And this is this emerging market concept, right? And now you do it again. Well, you can still kind of see the one on the left. This is in linear, not log. Um, so do we, uh, is it bubblicious? Yes. Is it potentially the third extraordinarily huge bubble on a log basis? Yes. Peter Brandt was talking about this recently, how this is, uh, I think I, I think he basically said it was un, like pure, truly unique in terms of having a third log bubble on a on a life cycle basis, but that is truly what we're seeing in this market. Uh, the the pricing that's happening in Bitcoin, in my mind, when this one ends, I feel like that's when we will enter the era of much lower volatility in Bitcoin because the adoption. Like relative to gold, for instance, if we hit this, say the cycle top is 25% of gold's market cap today, it's maybe 8%. So if we 3x relative to gold, that is a large macro asset. And it, it's just harder to be as volatile once you get to that point. So this is probably the great, the last great log bubble for Bitcoin in my mind. And it'll be more of a long-term uh, adoption and, you know, type of thing afterwards, but the party's fun. We don't even have an ETF yet though. What do you mean? Yeah. But grayscale is like one of the top 50 ETFs or something. Uh, if it was, if it were actually called one, um, I don't think the, let's say we cycle out at 250. Okay. Let's say we go to 250. What's after that, you know? the next the next targets after a, a bear market do you just go parabolic a fourth time and go hit like two million dollars per bitcoin or something i mean it depends <laughs> that's <laughs> the world is probably not a very happy place with yeah, two million I mean, dollar bitcoin I, yeah i don't know i don't know man it's, just, it's scary it, it's scary in a non-crypto sense obviously if you're in bitcoin you're, you're doing well but yeah, especially if you believe inflation is going up, which it most certainly is, and 
in all sorts of ways. And yeah, and I think when people look at the price, they have to realize the people buying here don't care about price in reality. They really don't. Um, yeah, like they've probably never looked at a chart on a historical basis before. Like they look at the chart that shows up when they pull up the app that they're buying it with. Like they're purely FOMOing. Well, I just mean like corporations and whatnot. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah. The the ultra high net worth people, they don't care what the price is. They they just don't want to be in the dollars right now. You know, they don't want to be in the gold right now. But all variety of things they just don't want to be in. Um, so I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to even expect the correction here when we had a correction in January already. Um, the, the, yeah, we could go further. We I could go know. further before we get the next big correction. Uh, I'm just looking at 62, 63. That's the next yearly pivot. So that's that's a magnet for me. Yeah, right I now. totally, I totally agree. That could be that could be where we go before we do any real cool off. Um, yeah. It makes me kind of nervous though. It's just like so much, so much bullishness. <laughs> You know, well, the, like, the, the thing that makes me nervous isn't the new people coming in. It's the funding rates and the open interest. It's yeah, the over, being over leveraged. Down. It's like we spike down 10% and there's new open interest to take make up for all the op open interest that got wiped out. Like whose money is this that's getting waxed constantly? Yeah, I agree. So, you know, when there is a pullback, it's going to be ferocious. <laughs> yeah, like I tweeted, it looked like I was, I said, I thought ETH was about to gig us in. And I have, there's like 600 likes on that, which I don't know, maybe, maybe there's new paradigm for Twitter engagement, but that's a lot. You know, it's like those, it, it's not a firm thing to base an opinion off of, but there's so much froth in the market. A friend was recently saying in a stock channel that you and I are in, they were like, their their friend was texting them like, "Hey, stocks are down one percent today. Do you like how long do you think this pullback will last?" <laughs> it's like it's one percent, man. And they act like it's you know CN CNBC needs uh, markets in turmoil. On like it freaks me out, Josh. It freaks me out. Well, legacy looks troubling, but if we print more money, right? I don't know. I don't know if that's priced in or not. I was going to ask you about the Dixie. Do you think the stimulus is priced in? Yeah, I think the stimulus is priced into the or the current stimulus is priced into the Dixie. I think the question is like, what's next? You know? Yeah. Um, speaking about uh, open interest and funding rates, real quick, if you there's a cool site, Viewbase, Viewbase.com, I think it's called. Okay. Um, they have uh, by exchange by asset funding rates, and they have open interest as well. Yeah, and this is nicer. I use one that's like BYBT or something, but this is this is nicer. And these rates are terrifying, aren't they? Yeah, uh, very much so. Look at these Can rates you explain for people that don't trade on margin? Number one, I find no reason to trade on margin in this market, especially unless you're a professional trader. Like Josh is a professional trader. He knows what he's doing, and his strategy is trading on margin. If you're doing it to FOMO, you can FOMO on common share on, on spot. Uh, there's no point on being on margin because you're paying out the wazoo and Josh will describe what that means. Right. So if you're long and fees are positive, you are paying per, per six hours, per four hours, whatever it is. I don't know if this is per day. Oh, it says eight hour rates. My bad. Yeah. So all quotes are, so every eight hours you're paying this percentage to be long in this asset. And eventually that just becomes too much to overcome uh, on the long side and people start closing their longs or they don't realize that they need to close their longs and FOMO close their longs, you know, all sorts of stuff. People see these rates, they don't long specifically because of the rates being absolutely insane. Uh, Deribit's on here as well. These rates are in high for Deribit as well. Um, Bifinex, or sorry, BitMEX historically, Look at these ETH fees or Mar ETH uh, rates, 0.34. Yeah. Like <laughs> what? <laughs> so that is roughly 1% a day, but that is of your position. So if you're 10X, you're actually paying that 1% per day of the 10X, not uh, so your underlying equity is, well, that's like 10% of your underlying equity if you're 10X cross, which is insane to start with. But people do this. In fact, they're like sometimes their average is like 20x. So you're literally blowing your account purely on on the fees. 
uh, without it, if it doesn't go up enough to make up for that. So the amount that it has to go up is so much that you just consistently have these scenarios when funding gets too out of whack, uh, and especially when certain exchanges get too degenerate, uh, it tends to be like a signal if there's like a premium from one, you know, derivatives only exchange versus the cash exchanges that it's just almost like a formula that they're just going to come wipe you out and have a 8%, 10%, whatever it takes wick to get that margin off, to get that open interest out of there. It's like, it's, it's just, it's just what happens. So your likelihood of being successful with that, unless you really, really know what you're doing, your likelihood of being successful that with that is very low, very low. And it would be a shame if Bitcoin goes to 100K, 250K, whatever it is, some life-changing amount of money for you, and instead you have nothing because you blew your account on margin. Yeah. I mean, we saw people blow their account on margin with GME and AMC, essentially, right? Like they fumbled, yeah. <laughs> they fumbled the top, lost their life savings. I keep seeing... Uh, article after article or whatever uh, about people doing that uh, with Jamie and AMC. So there's a good question in chat. How's that funding rate compare? They say to an average value, this bull run, this is from Reaper, good name for high funding. Um, what's interesting is the rise of the, of so much of the all open interest being on these exchanges. It really happened at the last cycle top. So like funding, people really understanding funding was mostly done through the bear market, like 2018 and then 2019 and then 2020. So seeing what happens when it's just pure FOMO across the board is pretty new. So a lot of the, it used to be cyclical. Like you could just guarantee if, if funding went too positive, we were just going to nuke. Um, whereas now, like, the price, we're still in a bull market. We're not saying we're bearish. But when you pay this much to be long, it's probably not going to work out for people very well or not like they hope. And we're just kind of learning like what, how much funding can the market actually absorb and, and maintain bullishness. And where it starts to matter is when you, you look at derivatives exchanges versus cash exchanges. Derivatives exchanges are your, you know, your, your BitMEX and your, uh, your buy bits and FTXs and stuff. Um, FTX has both, but same thing. And then your cash exchanges are your Coinbase's and your Krakens and your, you know, uh, wherever people are buying from or wherever you're charting that's not on margin. And when those get super apart, far apart, like buy bits running some $300 premium, you better be scared about being long because that's usually going to reverse. When the bid is super strong off Coinbase or something, that's almost uh, for certain going to be a much stronger push uh, because it's it's cash that's buying. It's not derivative to everything else. There's a guy on Twitter that's been talking about these flows, and he's done a great job with it. Um, but, yeah, that's that, that's my take on it. You want the cash bid. You don't want the derivatives-only bid. Yeah, it's just uh... – it's just too much to overcome uh, with between funding and people being margined to the hilt. Yeah. Um, they and, just get, they just get squeezed, right? Like yeah. squeezed in a variety of ways. And for what that's worth, the cash bid is almost never there on the weekend. So when you get the big weekend pumps and you're like buying into that, it could work, but it's the likelihood is much lower because the weekend pumps and stuff are almost always going to be derivatives led. If we look right now on, uh, let me fix my scales real quick. Speaking of um, cash pumps and whatnot, why isn't, there we go. Uh, if we look at the Coinbase versus Bitfinex premium, right now Coinbase is spiking way above uh, Bitfinex to, uh, you know, it's, it's like a super small percentage, but Coinbase is definitely leading Bitfinex for sure. Yes, yeah, so, and that would insinuate that on a Friday like this with, all those cash markets open, this is probably uh, cash led and real and more sustainable. What could happen though is we go from 56 to 58 over the weekend and it full retraces before Sunday or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and then there's the CME gap that is uh, semi realistic to pay attention to. 
because we close CME is closed right now. We're going up. So when it opens on Sunday, there's going to be a massive gap and yeah, blah, 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 blah. These are all the memes, but maybe not memes <laughs> that people who are overactive traders like us, uh, they look at to try to determine is the pump real? Is the move real and what to expect? Um, we haven't talked a whole lot about DeFi. I want to finish on that real quick, mostly to say uh, it's lagging. Like it's lagging. We're seeing, we're basically seeing a cool down in ETH based DeFi as uh, money goes back to BTC, as money chases easier moves like the BNB or BSC ecosystem. Um, and some of the older coins look to have stronger bids like, um, like even Litecoin. Oops. Uh, that looks really strong and Litecoin is DeFi. No, no, I'm saying off of DeFi. I'm saying <laughs> oh. off of DeFi. So <clears throat> I think we've seen pretty steadily like DeFi kind of cooling off as as some of these others uh, do stuff. That's not across the board. Like there's stuff that's still interesting. Um, like some that are like Ren is going crazy, but like Ren was kind of lagging before that. You know, like it's, but it's just kind of hit and miss. Um, yeah, this was the move I was looking for on Ren is the push above the 200 day. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's all this, it's, it's such a basic thing. It's all just rotation. It's rotation. And it's right people now, who are up. If you're up 10,000 X on Ave, at some point you're going to start selling, right? Like, yeah. You're going to say, look, I bought this at $40. I'm going to sell some at 400 or 500 and I'm going to go buy Litecoin with it or Monero or Zcash or something that hasn't pumped as much. And the rotation game is so real in crypto. So real, it's so reliable. Yeah, people don't care what it is, right? You might think, oh, this project is the next best thing since sliced bread, it's up 10,000%. Nah, not really. <laughs> it's just like Ave, you know, Ave's up whatever it's up. Um, people are gonna take profit. Sorry, yeah. you know? Well, when I talked over and over again about Ave, it was like, okay, I think it's, going to run the fibs and it ran the fibs. It went all the way to the 4.618, which was 500. It wicked above. And then now it's been retracing. And the question for me now is, does it retrace a little or does it retrace a lot? Um, that doesn't make me bearish on Ave the platform. It makes me not want to hold it. It's breaking below the 20 day. There's other charts that look better than this to me. It's just simple, basic, you know, lizard brain trading type stuff. Um, also, the, something else we didn't talk about is the uh, stablecoin issuances, which continue to increase, increase, increase. Uh, USDC is at $7 billion plus at this point, which is insane for USDC. Yeah, it's huge. Um, when you see issuing uh, more mints than burns, we're bullish. <laughs> it's just, the, <laughs> you know, it's hard to deny that. Um, that add that to the list of things that uh, to look at. That's all I got for today. Yeah, I think that's all I have to. I mean... Bitcoin is at $56,200 and very, very strong. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Weekend party for sure. Yeah. Congratulations, everybody that's playing it well, having fun, doing a good job, whatever. Don't forget, pay yourself. Enjoy. None of this is financial advice. We're just having fun chatting. Educational show. Thanks so much to uh, Token Sets for being our partner. Check them out for simplified asset management. Go to letterstatus.com slash sets. I want to ask you guys a favor. If you like the show, please, we love ratings and reviews on iTunes. It helps us show up when people are searching for crypto podcasts. See you next time. Monuments crumble in the blink of an eye.